welcome to the Album Man, and today I'm at long last going to be taking a look at Judas Priest Redeemer of Souls, definitely one of the most anticipated albums by most of 2014, and certainly one of the most anticipated for me. And yeah, it certainly seems that Judas is rising, if you, you know, Angel of Retribution reference there, but uh, still, they've come back with a brand new studio album, and this is their first studio album since 2008, it's very controversial Nostradamus, which had a pretty Marmite reception in the Priest fan base, with some of it citing it as a masterpiece, one of the crowning jaws, and others say dismissing it as one of their weakest efforts with Rob Halford, as the Tim Ripper Owens albums are a whole different beast. Now, personally, I'm in the camp of the people who love that record. I genuinely think it is one of their best albums. Yes, it feels a little bloated at times, and it's certainly a long album. You have to really dedicate some time to listen through both discs of their long songs. But I just feel it's so original. It was interesting. It was a breath of fresh air in the Priest catalogue of an interesting concept and it really was priest gone sort of prog metal and I've just found it fascinating and it's definitely up there with British Steel and Screaming for Vengeance as my favourite Judas Priest albums but then before Nostradamus in 2005 the first Halford uh, what album back was um, yeah, Angel of Retribution 2005 which is the first since Painkiller which was in 1990 I think which again is a fantastic album but in fact Angel has my one of, if not my favourite Judas Priest song of all time, which is weirdly worth fighting for. I just love that track. Um, I know some people say really worth fighting for. It's a decent single. I, I just, I don't know. To me, it's a stunning power ballad. I've always adored it since first hearing it. I mean, it was the first Priest song weirdly I ever heard. A very odd place to start with the band, but uh, they get that. That's why I started with them. So this album was also a bit experimental. It featured the epic and infamous Loch Ness, the 13 minute long priest track with some of the corniest lyrics in 13 minute song lens history. I mean, just some of the lyrics were atrocious for this song, but I found it interesting. I, I thought it was, a, it was a pretty cool track. But here, in Redeemer of Souls, we see Priest going back to the 70s, the 80s, and their classic material. In fact, we find glimpses of pretty much something from every album in their discography, except really maybe Turbo and the Tim Ripper and stuff. You maybe don't get that much stuff from Rock and Roller on it. Yeah, I would say you'll get a little bit of a vibe from that, but in general, not really. So their intention was to make a new classic album. Do they succeed, especially without the founding member and excellent guitarist KK Downing, who is a staple in the band since, well, the band formed and was replaced by Richie Faulkner um, on the Epitaph tour in 2011. Unfortunately, Kekka Down was replaced before I got to see them, which is unfortunate, but certainly Richie Faulkner did well on stage, um, so give us praise for that. But anyway, enough of introductions, let's just dig into Redeemer of Souls. Dragon Nought. I mean, what a name, Dragon Nought. It just sounds powerful and metal and corny as hell. I mean, apparently, if you want to know what a Dragon Nought is, it is a cross between a dragon and a juggernaut. I mean, it's a shocker, really. It's not much of a surprise, as you can tell. This is going to be a mature and reflective album to celebrate their forty odd years. And uh, now, this this is a silly album, but in a way that only priests can come off. The totally unironic silliness that priests have in their lyrics is just part of the charm. And here it does a very good job. I mean, this song starts with the very cliche opening of a storm and thunder, like the intro to Black Sabbath's debut album and the outro to Black Sabbath's 13. In fact, there's another parallel to 13 we'll see a little bit later on. I really don't think the thunder is that necessary to introduce it. I mean, it's still kind of cool. Thunder is awesome for opening metal records. It's hard to dispute, but... Uh, you know, it wasn't that great. I mean, I, yeah, we could have done without the thunder. It, it's still great, right. especially because this song, this just kicks it off with a bang and a scream. I mean, uh, the, the riff is killer, and the chorus as well is particularly catchy. I mean, it's a great way to open the album. Uh, just a killer solo and just screams Judas Priest as we've always loved them. It's definitely typically Priest more so that sort of E.T. is vain. And I mean, Dragon Knot, you could argue, doesn't have an original bone in its body, but that doesn't stop it from being such a fun song to rock out to. The single Redeemer of Souls, the title of the track from the album, is one I have already talked about. Um, so I'll just talk about it slightly briefer. 
I found this an enjoyable comeback single, and it's one of my favourite songs on the album. It's a classic style song with the same sensibilities you come to know from Priest, half as distinct and... Well, I've always found his voice, sometimes it can be a little kind of evil sounding, not quite like diamond evil, but it's a little bit evil. And I mean, we don't have as many high screams as we used to have. I mean, Halford is getting up there in age, he's in his 60s, but we do get some screams, or we do, and I, I'll tell you about them in a bit, but not on this song. Still, Halford's performance across the board is a strong one. Again, we'll talk about a bit more, but not much to say about this, except it has a particularly strong bridge, chorus. It's a good single. It's definitely a good lead single. I can understand perfectly why they chose this song as a single. The second single, I'm not as sure, but let's get to Horse of Valhalla first. Now this, this is an epic track. The music fades in dramatically, and when it kicks in, you're just bombarded by riffs. There's actually quite a few of them early on in this song, and they all work exceptionally well, particularly the leads playing before the chorus, which I think could be Richie. It just sounds fresh, energetic, but yet yeah, fast and melodic. And the guitar playing throughout this track really is sublime. And without a doubt, this is the best track on the album. I mean, it really is. Halford tells you of Vikings on a voyage and effectively and brilliantly conjures the treacherous conditions of the sea. And you can almost feel the hail and ice rain down upon you as you're going through the Nordic area and stuff. It's very Judas Priest, but oh, what stands out about this the most, what stands out the most is the vocal performance. This song, in the end of the day, there is one purpose to this song, and that is the vocals. In this short little section, we go from almost deep, ominous growling from Halford to this high-pitched pterodactyl-like screech, all within basically the same 30 seconds. It's just some of the most mesmerising and engaging Judas Priest music I've ever had. Seriously, Horde of Valhalla, so well crafted, combining Priest's melodic sensibilities, trademark vocals, technical wizardry, it's everything I would want from a modern Judas Priest song. Well, except the production, but... Uh, Again, that's a little later on. Yes, Halford's vocals, as I alluded to before, are strong here. I mean, while well, they're not as strong overall for the arms, they are on earlier efforts. Also, Valhalla, he just shows, hey, I'm Halford, I'm back, and does it in such style. So after the fantasy-based Halls of Valhalla, we also have another fantasy song, um, Sword of Damocles. And this song, first, let's just get into the theme behind this. I love the theme behind this song. This story is based on the um, sort of short story by Cicero, the Roman philosopher. And the story, in short, about the song, if you want to know, is that uh, Damocles told his king, Dionysius, that the king was extremely fortunate as he had wealth, power, etc. So the king offered to change places with Damocles so he could taste a life for himself. So Damocles sits on the throne surrounded by luxury and everything he could want. But then the king arranged that uh, a sword should be held above the throne and Damocles' head <laughs> held by one single horsehair. So, after this precarious sword held by one single horsehair, Damocles pleads the king to just let him leave and relinquish the fortune and let the king have it back. And the sort of the moral of the story is meant to be that with great power comes peril and anxiety. And I don't know, it's not something that really rings as true today, I suppose. You don't really get kings killing each other as much um, as you did in well, those times, I suppose. But still, the song. The song is, is why we're here, not the, you know, Cicero's philosophy behind this. And this has a fantastic intro of the jaw guitars and this sort of almost swaying drum beat beneath which really sets the tone for the song before Halford's voice comes in. The vocal performance here is a powerful one, particularly in the second verse. But one of the most interesting parts of the song, which I found slightly unexpected, was the quieter bridge with clean sounding guitars and it really provides a nice change of pace before the song reaches its conclusion in a typical priest fashion with monstrous drum beats, killer riffs and catchy courses, all being just so undeniable metal. Swords of Damocles is definitely a song that appeals to me in a musical way, in a thematic way. I can't help but like it. I like the next song. Oh, March of the Damned. Oh, March of the Damned. This is the second single from the album, and a song I was a little scathing about. I, uh, on my Facebook page, album and Facebook page, like, etc. below if, if you want to. I did a little text 
track review of this, and yeah, I, I was scathing towards it. I know that I've had a lot of people say, oh, March of the Down is the best song on the album. Really? Oh, okay, you, you could do welcome to have your opinion, whatever, but I can't say I particularly understand it. I found this a pretty dull song. In fact, I would say this is the weakest song on the album. <laughs> it really, um, it dashed a lot of my hopes for the album. I had redeemed so I was like, yeah, this is cool. March of the Down is like, oh shit, if the album's going to be like this. Uh, this might be making it onto my disappointed list instead of best list. But fortunately, the rest of the album doesn't. As this riff is pretty average, I mean, I just don't find much creativity or spark with this song, uh, you know, especially compared to Swords of Damocles and Halls of Valhalla before. But particularly what's underwater is the vocal performance. Um, Halford just sings in a sort of, well, sings along with the riff type style, which isn't very Halford. Halford more sings above the riff, more that Dio style as opposed to the Aussie sing along with the riff, and it just doesn't carry that power, and it is as infectious as the choruses of the last four songs. I mean, I understand this is meant to have the marching, plodded along feel to it, but instead it just has more of a dialed in on the regional feel to it. That's my two cents on it. It just doesn't do anything for me, it really doesn't, this track. Down in Flames is a fairly straightforward to the point priest song about we'll go down a flames in a blaze of glory as the chorus lyrics so tell you and I mean how much more cliche can get but each priest they get away with this don't they I mean it's the thing is this song it's not that memorable I mean it's it's odd it's, it's fairly it doesn't have anything um that extraordinary or unexpected I mean it's fun has a decent enough hook to it. What does stand out though really is the guitar work from Tipton and Richie Faulkner. And just to talk a little bit about Richie Faulkner, he fits in with this band very well. And while certainly he's not better than KK Downing, he does offer a freshness to Priest music that I feel was very much needs. Not to say that I would have preferred um, him to KK Downing having the choice, no I wouldn't. But let's take this album and Faulkner for what he is. The guitar playing is of a high standard, he manages to lock down with Tipton and really get into a groove on the riffage, as well as harmonise beautifully on the leads, and that's something um, dynamic and exciting to the lead guitar playing that maybe could have lacked um, if, if Downing was there. This song, it, it's, it's pretty good, but the next is definitely better. Hell and Back. Now, this really harkens back to the classic 70s priest from its gentle beginnings as um, its crescendo into a bluesy, more groove-orientated song with Ian Hill's bass actually audible and prominent on this song. I know, it's like the first time in the album you actually know he exists. And this song definitely feels um, a little different, and some could say even more maybe out of place to what's come before, but I find it a refreshing change of pace. And certainly this second half of the album is a little bit slower than the more frantic, more speed metal-esque um, first half, which really was just hard-hitting metal. We now find more sort of the 70s and maybe some more hard rocking material, and this is definitely more of a hard rock song that showcases some of the other elements that's loved by Judas Priest fans that this band has. Still, this carries the infectious hooks that the album so far has had, had, but with more of a hard rock and uh, retro 70s style priest feel to it. Uh, definitely a sort of song I like. Cold Blooded. Now, musically, this is one of the more interesting songs on the album. It's one hell of a song with the drums and rhythm really driving the tempo and musical change across the song. Um, if only the bass work from Hill was a, a little bit more audible, but still the drum work from. Um, the drummer, who I've forgotten the name of, <laughs> is um, superb, it really is. And this like, it incorporates so many elements with its slower sections, it's all like riffing, catchy chorus, and definitely something I feel may have fitted on more Angel of Retribution and certainly more later era Priest, but really it's the middle instrumental passage that sets it apart and just takes you on a journey. Definitely a song I recommend listening to. Though I think now it's time to talk about the production. The production here, to be frank, is awful. Let's just set that straight. The production is really the leech that tries to suck all the life out of this record. Every little droplet of blood and energy it tries to suck up and make it sound like a dried husk of an album. Compared to the production of their classic material, what we have here is brick walling at its most brick walled. This album has to have about as much dynamic range as white noise, and is sadly another victim of the loudness war. Rest in peace, Redeemer of Souls. 
And damn, this album is unnecessarily loud, though sometimes inconsistently. At some points we have Alfred screaming, trying to burst open your eardrums, and other times we have his voice a little lost and maybe muddied in the mix, um, which is a bit odd. The bass is... where? The bass is about his existence as it is an injustice for all. <laughs> it's... well, let's, maybe that's a bit carried away. The bass is not exactly that prominent. And the guitars have quite a digitised, processed feel as my wall falls down. Um, and yes, I know they were mixed like this so there's people listening to it at, a, at you know, MP3 super lossy files and that poor sound quality phones via that poor sound quality came in the box of the phone. Headphones can have a nice loud experience, but for those of us that actually give a damn about audio fidelity, this album is not pleasing to the ears at all. In the same way that Metallica's Death Magnetic has some fantastic songs and songwriting, A Day That Never Comes, what a track. If only the snare drum on it just didn't destroy your ears because it just sounds so loud, so obnoxious. Unfortunately here, this, the reduction is horrific. The mixer, uh, the master, just everyone involved in the production of this album needs to be lined up against a wall and shot. That's all I have to say. This takes away from the listening experience and I'm not impressed by the production. Though, there's not much in modern production as I am impressed by, I'm afraid. Still, surely a song that starts with a scream and is called Metalizer can surely redeem some of the awful production. And you know what? It kind of does. I mean, I really like this track. I know that others consider this one of the weaker tracks on the album, but I don't know, there's a charm to it with me. The repetitive chugging riffs and the classic falsetto laden chorus really reminds me of Painkiller and again, maybe Angel, I suppose, which albums I love. This track works so well and has some of the best shredding, I would argue, to be found on the album, but yet all in a musical and melodic context instead of just shredding for the sheer sake of speed, aka Steve Vai. Its lyrics are cheesy, but it's priest and they do it with style. And, I mean, it starts with a scream. Yeah, that's pretty cool in itself. The Crossfire, the song I alluded to a little earlier, really is one of the highlights from this album, with a surprising but welcome dirty blues riff, almost slightly Hendrixy, you could say, definitely of that sort of Hendrixy, Zeppelin-y sound, and reminiscent of like Sandwings of Destiny, Stained Class, those late sort of 70s Priest albums. And I would also say maybe this sort of the heavy blues that Black Sabbath came to pioneer. Not to say it sounds as doomy as Sabbath, but definitely that heavy blues um, thing is, is present. And the wah-wah pedal particularly is used to great effect on the central riff. Uh, the lyrics as well are also quite interesting, talk about religious extremists using religion to justify their ends, and definitely attract the works wonders, a change of pace, something slower, gentler, but brilliant. Secrets of the Dead has a, quite a modern priest feel to it, and isn't too dissimilar from the work found up Nostradamus, actually, though it certainly is a lot shorter than the songs found there. The song also has this really Egyptian feel to it with some of the note choices, and it's a vibe that I think could really work well in the right context, and here it does. Again, like Halls of Valhalla sort of Damocles, it has that fantasy um, epic feel, and the whole song just has such a grandeur to it. And I think it's one of the most diverse and interesting tracks on the album, particularly the effect on the last solo, which I can't think what pedal it is they use, and I think it's Richie who plays it, but it's such a cool sound, whatever it is now. Um, yeah, just one of the best solos on the album as well. And this song, it's very original. I also really like this spoken word part, I'm just a sucker. Uh, I, and yeah, spoken word pardon, I'm just a suck in general for priest epic and almost power metal like tracks, and I think this is one of the best on the album, without a doubt, a highlight, a very epic y, great song. Battle Cry. Now, I'm not really going to dwell on this one, I mean, the intro is freaking amazing, there's a sort of tapping part and fast play, and all. it's a great intro, but then the rest of the song, it's not quite as good. Um, it's another big pre-song that's really surmised in its own title. It sounds like a battle cry and it's a solid song with some particularly nice screams. Beginning of the end. Is it is it now compulsory for Metal Legends to release a song with this title? I mean, we had Sabbath on 13 last year. and But here, though, we find it at the end of the album. It truly is the 
beginning of the of literally the end of the album. Um, now traditionally this song would usually be felt by a ballad, that's a traditional metal ending of the album. Well, we get a we get a ballad. That's certainly the vibe I get from this with the reverberated guitars in the intro and Halford's gentler, more soothing vocals. Yeah, and in a fairly traditional manner then in the second verse, guess what comes in? Oh, it's the percussion, yes. This song is certainly as predictable, as cliche as you can get, but it's a lovely track with another um, infectious chorus that really ends the album on a calmer but satisfying note, though it's not as good as we're fighting for, but at least it's not Loch Ness, I suppose. Overall, my take on this album is that it's a pretty strong release in Judas Priest's catalogue, and certainly one I'll be going back to. I think the songwriting is of high quality, though the production does certainly hamper the experience. It's mainly just nice after six years to finally be hearing some new Judas Priest material. As I said, it's definitely one that will stay on rotation throughout 2014 for me. It's definitely better and certainly far more consistent than I was expecting from the two lead singles. And there really just aren't any clunkers, I mean, even the weaker songs like uh, Battle Cry, even, well, March the Damned is a little bit of a clunker, but it's not that bad. Uh, I still feel um, that they managed to satisfyingly cover uh, their 40 year career and surmise it in this one album, though it's fairly safe. And I mean, I do find it a bit sad that they had to go so safe on some, not so they do take some. You know, they do do some interesting things, like on Secrets of the Dead and Horses of Valhalla. In general, I, I do feel a bit sad that they were put off after Nostradamus really experimented. I can't see another experimental priest album coming our way, which I'm sure some of you will rejoice about. But for me, I love it when a band experiments, even if it ends up being an absolutely awful album. I'll still respect the living hell out of it. But that's just because I love experimentation and I love progressive music. And... The only other criticism I'd really level at Sam is just that it doesn't have any classics in particular. I mean, yes, I, I praise the living hell out of Halls of Valhalla, but in general, it just doesn't feel like there's anything as immediate, I suppose, as Breaking Law or Painkiller, where a lot of the hooks are good, they just don't have that classic feel to them. Um, maybe over time they could start to gain some classic status, as I listen to the album more, it's hard to judge, only a couple of weeks after release. Uh, well, I suppose the other thing I might say is that I feel the album's a little bit too long. Um, I still maintain that the perfect album length is between 40 and 50 minutes, and for a priest album, they shouldn't be going over 45 minutes. They really shouldn't. Their classic albums are 40 minutes, and they're bloody, bloody good. Um, combined the five bonus tracks, which I haven't listened to, and I um, can't say I'm going to be covering in this or this video, will be about as long as the album. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a little bit too long. Could feel maybe if it dropped 10 minutes, I suppose. It could be a bit better. Still, I'm going to give this album an 8 out of 10. I really enjoyed this. Um, it's not the maybe the strongest in their catalog, but I would certainly put it up that I really would. Um, it's an album I enjoy a lot. I think one I'll be going back to. And who knows how I hold over the test of time, particularly with the production. Maybe in a few years I'll look back at this and think it's a 7. But at the moment, I think this is an 8 out of 10 album. One of the better metal records of the year. And yeah, this has been the album, man. Thanks for watching. Comment and subscribe as usual. Long live. Rock and roll.